I'm ready. I'm ready. Hey, everybody. Looks like we are now live. Uh, welcome to another edition of Anthropological Inquiries. Uh, and today, my guest is uh, Scott Suarez, uh, and he's going to talk to us about spider monkey cognition. Uh, so, Scott, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, academically or, or in general? Uh, both. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I, I, I'll say that I'll start off by saying I, I'm currently a instructor of anthropology, biological anthropology at San Diego Mesa College in San Diego, California, which I absolutely love. San Diego is one of the greatest places. I've lived a lot of places, and it's one of the best places I've ever lived. I've been here for about five years now. Uh, I think coming up this summer. Before that, I taught for about ten years at um, Miami University of Ohio, not the Miami, Florida, but the Miami of Ohio. Where I taught anthropology there for about 10, uh, 10 years. And um, although, professionally, I've done, um, I did my dissertation research in Ecuador, and I think that's what we'll talk about here, studying spider monkeys. And I also spent two years uh, studying and researching in Thailand for leaf monkeys there as well. Um, and then way, way before that, um, actually even before I ever went to graduate school, and I guess I, went, I got my PhD from Stony Brook University in New York, part of the Interdepartmental Scott, doctoral can I, program. Oh yeah, can go I ahead. stop go you ahead. for a second? Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. you have a, a YouTube window open by chance? Uh, you're, uh, we're getting some echoing, some feedback. It sounds like from uh, oh, one of the viewers. I don't. Let me just see. Um, I'm going to stop the chair here because it's taking up my screen. Sure. Um, I, I, I definitely don't have this channel open. Um, I'm not following it. But I will just, in general, I'll make sure that everything's closed. I don't have a. I no worries, YouTube no worries. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't have a YouTube or anything open. Um, let me just make sure my phone is not doing anything in weird either. So, no, okay, there's nothing on my phone either. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know what that's. I don't know what that's about. What I probably is is I'm probably connecting to you. So, all right, hold on. I, I'm, I'm muting my microphone a little bit so that one's oh, okay. not echoing back in. Let me change this up. Okay. Uh, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. No, that's fine. Quickly do a, an introduction again one more time. Okay. That, that should. Help, so. Okay. Um, j just to sort of just to, just to recap, I guess I'll go, I'm going chronologically backwards. I think that's probably the best way academically, anyway. So I currently teach at uh, biological anthropology at San Diego Mesa College in San Diego, where I love. I love this place so much. Um, it's, uh, and I, this is where I'll be until I think I retire. Um, and I've been here for about five years. Before here, I taught at um, Miami University of Ohio in the anthropology department there, and I taught there for ten years. Um, and I, I started teaching there as soon as I got back from my postdoc research. Um, and I did my postdoc research in Thailand, in northeastern part of Thailand, where I spent two years studying fire raised leaf monkeys, with the, their diets and, and their ranging behavior. Um, and then that was that came right on the heels of getting my PhD, which I got at Stony Brook University in New York. It was part of the interdepartmental doctoral program in anthropological sciences. And I got my PhD, I think, in 2003. And my research there is, I think, what we're going to talk about today. It's the it's the work on spider monkeys. And then, actually, before that, um, well, for, for a year before I went to grad school, uh, or for about three years before I went to grad school, I used to work for the, uh, um, what is this, the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And they had, at the time, a research park um, where they were conducting research on captive animals, actually, um, in, in, in Texas. So I actually taught for three years there. Uh, or I, I studied um, rhesus macaques there for three years, not taught, but studied rhesus macaques for three years there. Before that, I actually spent, and this is going to get weird, but I actually spent a year playing lead guitar in a metal band, um, which was my, <laughs> my my lifetime fantasy. And then before that was undergrad, but I actually was interested in primates even into undergrad, and I'd actually managed to study some spider monkeys back back my senior year of college as well. So that's kind of my, my academic um, history in weird reverse order. Um, cool. Very cool. I also actually briefly went to school for music. Yeah. Uh, so, and also played the guitar, which I have right back over there. But, yeah, mine's, uh, so, mine's... Uh, you know, small, small world. We all seem to have a lot of overlap in here for sure. That's, yeah, um, that's, that's, that's my passion. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, uh, do me a favor because, you know, people hear about what primatology all the time, but uh, what is primatology? What are you, what are you trying to do? And, and then also, 
Uh, what's it like to be a primatologist in the field? Walk us through a kind of a, a day okay. of a day in the life of a primatologist. Sure. Um, so, and actually, this might be one of those cases where I might share something in a second, just to sort of. I've got some some clips and some shots or some uh, photos, which will help. But to, to start with, primatology is a really fascinating field. It's, it, it means the study of, of primates, which includes um, lemurs, lorises, galagos, tarsiers, um, monkeys of the Americas, and monkeys of, of um, Africa, Asia, and technically a small part of Europe. It also means studying um, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and so, so the great apes. And Primatology is a field that really it can be approached from a number of different academic perspectives. So I happen to be an anthropologist, and as an anthropologist, we study humans. And so my motivation in studying primates, uh, my motivation is to better understand those pressures that lead to characteristics we see in humans. For example, the one that interests me the most is, is big brains. Why humans have abnormally large brains, and we want to know why we have big brains. Well, one of the ways we can approach this is by looking at our closest relatives. And if we can understand the, the evolutionary pressures that made them have bigger brains, because primates, monkeys, apes, you know, lemurs, they all have bigger brains than non-primate animals of their same body size. So if we can understand the pressures that led them to have big brains, we gain some understanding into the, the pressures and or the pathway that led humans to have big brains. So the primary motivation for studying primates from, from my perspective as an anthropologist is to better understand humans. But there are people who are psychologists who are primatologists who study primates because they want to understand the workings of the brains. Or there are people who are biologists or zoologists who, under, who study primates, you know, maybe from a behavioral perspective. And so there's lots of approaches, but as an anthropologist, my, my main goal is to get at um, trying to understand humans better by, by studying our, our closest relatives. And I think that's a little bit counterintuitive to people is, you know, why are you an anthropologist if you study monkeys? But the answer is to better understand humans. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna jump into a slide and it's gonna get a little sloppy um, because this isn't in any necessary, necessarily big order. But I figured I'd show, a, yeah, so talking about the day in life of a primatologist, you know, sure. obviously as a, primatolo as, a, as a primatologist, you almost always have to go where those animals um, are. You know, if, if you're interested in studying evolutionary pressures, one approach is to go to the wild, um, go to the forests where they live. So, and since we don't have primates or monkeys or apes or anything, almost with a couple small exceptions, there really aren't any running wild in the United States. We have to go to, um, usually have to go to other countries. And so, for example, um, for my dissertation research, I went down to Ecuador and I spent my time in the Amazon basin of Ecuador, and I was there for about a year and a half for almost two years. And then to study the leaf monkeys, I was I lived in Thailand, um, in northeastern Tha in a in a forest in northeastern Thailand for for um, two years when I was there. So you have to be where the animals are. And so this this is my students always laugh at this. This is um, them before they were born. But this is this is me back around I think 1999 or so. Um, chasing after spider monkeys. This could be as early as 95, but this is sometime in the in the late 90s of me actually actually following monkeys, you know, deep in the rainforest, uh, the Amazon rainforest in, in Ecuador. And the, the monkey on the left, by the way, is a uh, is one of the spider monkeys I studied. She was one of the group members of the spider monkeys I studied. And, um, it's, this is a weird aside, but I used to name my monkeys after characters in books I was reading at the time. I read a lot of books in the fields because you, you do a lot of sitting around, but um, this I named this monkey. This monkey's name was Chichina, which happened to be the um, girlfriend of Ernesto Che Guevara when he was in high school, because I was reading a biology about him at the time, and that name popped up when I very first met this monkey. So that's that's her name. For me, the typical day, and I'm going to go way forward here. Um, the typical day for me involved um, getting up usually pre-dawn. Um, for my research, I wanted to be with the monkeys all day from the time they woke up until the time they went to bed. And I did that for anywhere from 10 to 14 days in a row. So for about... ...and all the, all the gear that I had, um, which included um, compasses, backpacks with your food and your water. Um, I, binoculars are essential. Um, in this picture, I'm actually wearing snake guards. Um, the little burlap wraps around your legs because 
you can't always watch where you're going and, and there's a risk of stepping on a venomous snake. So I always, um, I put those on and long sleeve shirts, to protect your body and so on. And so you get up, get all your gear, eat breakfast. And then I would get driven in a pickup truck. And um, let's see if I have a picture of that somewhere around here. I would get, uh, there's one, I know there's one around here somewhere. And I, I would get driven in a pickup truck and I, they would drop me off at the forest. And this is actually the edge of the forest where I was. And so I get out of the truck enter into some trails, hike into the forest, and then I would have to go find in the dark still. It's, at this point, it's like 5.30 in the morning. I would have to go and find where the monkeys are and where, the, where I had left them the night before or where they were sleeping, wait for them to wake up, which was usually around 6 o'clock in the morning, plus or minus a little bit, and then follow them all day everywhere they went in the forest. Um, so everywhere they went, I had to go with them and n not lose track of them. And then I would follow them in the forest until they went to bed at night, which was usually around six or six thirty at night. And uh, then once they went to sleep, then I could hike out of the forest, which could take anywhere from 20 minutes to, to 45 minutes, depending on where they went to sleep. And then I would go back out to the road and, and try to find the pickup truck that would drive me back to the research station where I stayed. And I would do that. And then I would actually, the day wasn't over then because I would take a quick shower, have dinner, and then go work in my lab where I would process um, plants or, or things that I had collected and enter data into my into my data books, into my and, and into the computer at the in the evening. So I'd usually be done about nine nine thirty at night, um, write in my journal, and then go to sleep and start all over again. So that was that was the typical day, um, and the typical day was spent in the forest. I don't know. I've got some pictures around somewhere. Of, of yeah, yeah. So sometimes the forest is is uh, this is me years later with with one of my students um, when we went back to go study some squirrel monkeys but the forest is is full of <laughs> deadly things plants vines um hills and, and you spend all day out there usually off trail wow so obviously uh uh, uh that's a, a very can be very long and grueling i bet sitting around and just waiting for things to happen uh what's the longest amount of time you've spent in a field like continuously are you talking weeks months did you ever spend like a year anything like that well so i was I, this i actually i'm gonna go back to a couple of slides in here i'll see the right image i was incredibly lucky um it, this is going to sound not lucky um so Pardon the uh, a bit of here a bit of slight nudity isn't a problem. Uh, um, I was doing my research in the eastern part of Ecuador, so it's in the the Amazon basin, and you can actually see it on the, the slide over here. This is going to be me in my professor mode now. Um, so it's in the a park called the Yasuni National Park, and it stands on the the eastern part of Ecuador. And this part of Ecuador, especially the Yasuni National Park, is is um, actually exploited for oil by Ecuador, who happens to be a country that doesn't have a lot of money. And so they get a lot of their money by, by oil uh, from the rainforest. And the area where my monkeys, where, where my research was done was actually um, alongside of some roads that were used by, by the oil company. In fact, this picture here of this oil well, and these trucks, and everything, this cleared out area, this was, I, I'm actually standing under one of the, one of my spider monkeys, most common sleep trees and looking down the hill at this area. Now, the advantage to that, there were a couple, we had roads that I could get back and forth to my research area. I could actually approach the study area from a couple of different angles. The other, the other advantage was, and again, this is where I'm going to wish I had, oh, the other advantage was we actually had a research station. And so our research station had buildings, for example, um, and these were donated by the oil company to the, to the university that I worked through. And so we had buildings, we had a generator, actually, we had hot water, we had um, electricity, we had a dining hall, um, that, and we had a staff that would cook for us. So this was about as cushy a field experience as anybody could imagine. And I think I, I often felt shame talking to my fellow primatologists because a lot of them would you know, stay in a tent in the middle of nowhere. Um, my brother did some work in Central Africa where they were deep in the jungle for you know months at a time. I wasn't quite so remote. I couldn't have, I couldn't have worked 13 hours a day for 14 days in a row um, in the forest if I didn't have this kind of in infrastructure behind me. And that was necessary for the kind of data that I was collecting. So I, was, I would be down there for a couple of months at a time, um, but then every once in a while, and this is in the days before um, Wi-Fi was so common, um, I didn't have internet there at the time when I was there. So if I wanted to communicate with the United States, if I wanted to do internet, I had to um, travel back to Quito, which was uh, usually about a 14-hour 14, 14 trip from where I was 
uh, an all day trip really to get me back to Quito. So I, I would stay down there three or four months at a time. And then I'd go back um, every three or four months to communicate and pay bills and that kind of thing. So that's probably about the longest. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about your research a little bit. Um, let's see. So in one of your articles that you sent over to me, uh, you mentioned something called a fission fusion social system as being ideal for studying cognition. Mm -hmm. What does that mean and why is it ideal? So a fission fusion social system is actually one of my favorite things about spider monkeys. Most monkeys or, or quite a few monkeys, really, they travel around in these big packs, these big hordes where there's a bunch of males and a bunch of females or, or in some primates, it's one male and a bunch of females. But they're usually a big group of animals and they all coordinate their movement and they all travel together. And then they, you know, they all do things in unison. There are a handful of primates. Um, spider monkeys is, is one of the most uh one of the most dynamic um, chimpanzees is another example. And there are a number of lemur species that do the same thing where, where the whole community of, of group members, or in this case, spider monkeys, the whole community of spider monkeys is rarely together at the same place at the same time. So rather than all of them hanging out, they all kind of like humans just go off and do their own things. So, and this can be, uh, it's called fission fusion because maybe you wake up in the morning, you and, and seven or eight of your friends wake up in the morning, you're all slept together in the same tree. And then you fission. Some of them, maybe three or four monkeys decide to go to the north to go to a delicious feeding tree up the north. And, and the other four or five of them are free to go down south and they go to a different tree. And then these two little fissioned groups may never see each other again that day. Or, or maybe they'll bump into each other later. And then so, and, and we call it fusion because every once in a while, other monkeys will show up in these little groups. So, you know, I might, I might be following a group of six monkeys in the morning, and then I might be focusing on um, just one monkey for about three or four hours in the afternoon, and maybe she gets joined by a friend, and now I'm with two for a few hours, and then they join back up with that original group later on. So the, the, the groups, the members that are coordinating their activities are, they're constantly coming together and then splitting apart in kind of unique um, combinations throughout the day. And so this, this kind of social system, it's all within their territory, but they just don't hang out together all the time. And, and the reason this is ideal is what I was interested in was studying individual choices. And, and in order to really collect scientific data, you usually want, um, you know, you want to have a, a sample size, a decent sample size of, of individuals. And if I were to study a, a group of cohesive monkeys, about where they went and where they foraged, um, the whole group would travel together. And so I would be able to see, okay, where does this group go? What, where, they started a feeding tree, where are they gonna go next? I could look at their choice of what tree to eat in next. And that's, that's one choice. But with spider monkeys, I could, and what I would do is I would follow one monkey. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. I would follow one monkey for two weeks. It's, I think it's kind of like a stalker. Wow. I'd follow, yeah, one monkey for two weeks. And so for one two week period, the, we call them a focal monkey. My monkey might be the one I named Emma. And so I would follow her no matter how the group split up, I would always make sure it was her that I was with for two weeks. And then the next time period, I'd be in the same territory, but maybe I would study a female I called Dominique uh, or Dom for short. And then the next one I would study, um, I might follow you know, um, another female, Mercedes, for example, I would follow her for, for a few weeks. And so what this allowed me to do was notice individual differences in range use, in decision patterns, in association patterns, but all within the same territory. So it allowed me to have multiple perspectives on the same use of the same territory, where if I studied a, a big clump moving group of primates, I would have one group and one set of decisions. So this allowed me to make, you know, to see different animals that shared the same territory, but made different kinds of decisions within that territory. Oh, it sounds a lot like maybe studying high school or something, right? Well, in, in class, I always use the example, you know, you wake up in the morning and, and you know, you're with your parents, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, and then you, you leave your parents and you join some friend, you get a ride from a friend to school and then you join 30 or 40 students in class. Then you go off with your lunch and, and do the same, you know, so you're, you're constantly changing who you hang out with. And so it, it's a familiar social system for us. So yeah, then, then by uh, nature, then it, it, it makes sense to study them if you're trying to study human cognition, because you you know you're studying the origins of human cognition, because you see a lot of overlapping social systems, is that essentially? Yeah, okay. and and there, and there's extra pressure. So if you think, well, we haven't mentioned yet, but the idea is, and that's what you're getting at, is is the, for for my research, the big issue was there are certain challenges with finding food. You know, finding food is essential, but there are certain challenges with finding a food, especially for monkeys like spider monkeys who are 
ripe fruit specialists. They eat fruit when it's the ripest. Uh, and, and they don't eat a lot of other things, maybe leaves occasionally and, and some other weird things like soil or, or, or um, dead wood. But they, they really specialize on ripe fruit. It's where they get their energy from. And ripe fruit is, is essentially rare in a rainforest. There's, you know, you think of a rainforest trees covered in fruits, but I think my data showed something like around 600 meters on average distance between any two feeding trees, any two fruiting trees, which is too far to see. You can't see the next fruit tree from where you are. So you've got to know where it is. And you can't just wander around. Some of my research, which we can get to in a little bit, some of my research shows that if you just wander around looking for a fruit tree, you're going to spend way too much energy wandering and not enough. You're not going to get enough food. So there's pressure on them to find to find food. And if you're in a big group now, this is this is where it's important. If you're in a big group, only one monkey needs to know where the food is. and You just follow them. So you could be really dumb and just follow them along. But in a fission fusion group, and I think this is what you were, your, your comment was, in a fission fusion group, if they split up, you're on your own. You can't follow anybody else. So you need to know, at least for your corner of the forest anyway, you need to know where the trees are. And, and this isn't just a choice of where are the trees, because the trees that are fruiting change from week to week, from month to month. And so the, the set of fruiting trees available in the fall or, or in, in October are very different than the set of fruiting trees available in in. April. So you're not only have to know where they all are, you have to keep track of which ones are fruiting, which ones are no longer fruiting. And, and you know, you're, so you're constantly updating information. And this is all done on an individual level, which is maybe why that, that kind of uh, cognition is why it's relevant to humans. Yeah. So what does it, what does this tell us about human cognition or, or, or at least <laughs> early human cognition? Well, I would love to think it told us a lot. Um, th there are three broad hypotheses the three broad ideas as to why brains get big in humans, why humans have big brains. Um, one of them we, we call the ecological model, which is what I was studying, the idea that the pressures of finding food, especially rare food, high quality rare food, um, require things like memory and um, efficient search strategies. And so that kind of drives brain size up. There's a second major hypothesis that says that, you know, big brains are all part of being social, that is living in a big social group and keeping track of friends and enemies and allies and who owes you favors and who's done you wrongs so that you can more efficiently navigate the social environment. And so as group sizes get bigger, brain sizes or, or cognitive ability needs to go up. And then there's a third model that says that, you know, once we start using tools, using tools to, to effect, effectively or, or efficiently get high quality, but very difficult to, to acquire resources, like opening up a palm fruit, for example, a palm seed, or a palm, a coconut, if you will, you know, it requires breaking into. And so the use of tools drives brain size up. And none of those ideas are mutually exclusive. The, traditionally, the, the ecological model has been kind of pushed aside and, and the social models were favored. But um, without getting into too much detail, the earliest primates 65 million years ago or whatever were probably solitary creatures. And then at a certain point, they switched from this insectivorous diet uh, they were nocturnal, solitary, and insectivorous. And they switched from an insectivorous diet to a fruit-eating diet. And so it's probably at that point that, that there's already pressure for them to develop bigger brains. And then once they, they start shifting to being awake at the daytime, then they're allowed to be in bigger groups. And then that maybe the second pressure takes over. And now they, they get bigger brains for a second reason. And then eventually some of them develop tool use and that drives brain size even farther. And so it's rather than being all, all independent, there's probably multiple pressures, but at least the ecological model, the one, the one that I was investigating is um, at least, at least there at the beginning, if not running all throughout our evolution. And so you think about humans, you know, if you want to find, if you want to, to hunt, for example, early hunters, you needed to know where to find the animals. You need to know how to track them and, and know their routes and their paths. And, and you had to be able to travel from place to place efficiently, efficiently, which all requires the same kind of ecological knowledge. And so that even, even for now, even amongst humans, there may be pressure for, for uh, evolutionary pressure for, for um, those kinds of skills, which might drive up brain size as well. Yeah, and I, I know growing up, I uh, in high school, I, I went hunting with my father and some of his friends and, and brothers. And uh, you know, when you're just wandering into things randomly, it is incredibly difficult. But if you mm -hmm. go back to an area frequently and say, "Okay, we know that the herd passes through this area certain days and this area mm -hmm. certain days," then certainly that's that can be a big, big advantage. Um, well, uh, versus... I'll tell you. 
Go ahead. Yeah, walking around, yeah, walking around the area trying to find spider monkeys. You know, in the very beginning of every follow, I would go into the forest and I would just like walk around and try to find them. Right, in the very beginning, that's just a nightmare. You're walking around <laughs> looking for monkeys, and and you could theoretically go days without seeing them. This 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 is my um, one of my uh, former students who's actually in grad school now. Um, her name is Mara, and so we were down there looking for squirrel monkeys at the time. But this looks like we're being lazy in these photos. This is actually exactly what you just said. This is us efficiently looking for monkeys. If you know places where their monkeys are likely to cross, and so this gets into another part of my research, if you know their regular travel routes, or if you know the places where they like to go, they they like to feed efficiently, you know, a lot. Well, it's actually just as easy to find monkeys by sitting in one spot and waiting as it is by running around you know, all day looking for them. And it's way less exhausting. So, um, I mean, this on the right, this is my student. Um, she discovered that the, the GPSs that we used with her uh, when she was there um, have video games in them. So she's playing video games, right? Or, or writing in her journal or writing, you know, taking notes. This is actually looking for monkeys. And, and what was really funny is uh, there was a day we were exhausted. It's, it's tiring, you know, hiking through the forest all day long. So one of the first days that I was teaching her about chasing monkeys, we were up at the top of this hill, right in the picture on the left there. And I said, let's just let's just hang out here. And so I laid down, put my pack down as a pillow like she's doing. And, and I started to take a nap. She's like, if you fall asleep, we won't find monkeys. And I said, no, trust me, we will. And half an hour later, you know, I'm half asleep. I hear monkeys in the distance jump up. We run down the hill and, and there they are. Right. So we picked a good spot. And as long as you're not completely asleep, what a great way. Now, if you're exhausted, now sometimes you get bored doing this. And so you just get up and you start wandering anyway. But it is it, if you know, if you know, then it's so much easier. And honestly, I'll tell you this too, is part of my research, once I followed monkeys a lot with the spider monkeys, they began to use regular pathways. Hmm. And part of my work was documenting this, this route network. I think that, um, I think one of the papers I said to you was about that. And once that happened, following them was so much easier hmm. because it's like, oh, I'm on this path. I know up ahead there's an intersection. So I better, I better pay attention to, are they going to turn left or right here? And it was so much easier to follow them than in the early days when I was just like running after them, hoping that I wouldn't lose them. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, and um, uh, of course, um, you know, this gets into the next question because now they have these established routes. Um, and in one article, you talked about the possibility of spider monkeys contributing to their own ecological niche niches. Mm -hmm. So what kind of are they actively managing their land or is it something like that? Is there some sort of symbiotic relationships that the spider monkeys have to their their, their fruit trees, uh, you know, do they alter their environment will, willingly? Yeah, almost. I mean, I don't they do it intentionally, but it is almost certain that they do. So I, I think if I go, I don't remember if I have any of those. This is a, a talk I gave for some students, and I don't remember if I if I taught. I did I went a couple of pages here, so I'm going to pull up the skip past the sexy pictures. So um, the this this graphic here represents. Um, so as my dissertation, you know, I'm with the monkeys all day, right? I'm with them from, from, I started collecting data either when they woke up or at six in the morning. And I didn't stop collecting data until either six o'clock at night or when they stopped moving, whichever was later. And so every five minutes, my watch went off and every five minutes I would record the location of the monkey I was following. And, um, and, and this is actually my dissertation work was back before we were, before GPSs were usable. They had GPSs, but the military would scramble the data. So you couldn't get accurate readings with, you know, within a hundred meters. So I was doing everything relative to trail points or, or no, known points. And so this picture here is kind of a top, a, a topography map of my field site. So just to orient you quickly into here. Um, these black lines are the roads that the oil companies use to get from place to place. This little hash marked area is that photograph I showed earlier of the oil well that I was standing up on the hill looking down at the oil well. And then you can see that this field site is characterized by lots of hills. And each one of these dots here, and this, this picture has 15,000 dots, by the way. Wow. Um, yeah, this is so, I mean, this is every five minutes for, you know, about just over a year of data collection. So this is, um, this is where they went. And you'll notice that there are these like heavily used pathways that, that they tend to run along tops of hills. So I think like humans, they most often chose to walk where it's easiest. Nobody wants to go up and down hills. They mostly walked on top of the hills. And so I think there's an energy efficiency here yeah. um, going on. Um, and then the, every once in a while they would cross at places where it was just 
you know, it's easier to cross it or just go all the way around the circle. If they wanted to go from here to here, they would rather than do that or go here. They would just, you know, go down the hill, then back up again. And I hated this hill because this was super steep here. So, you know, they, they would use these. And then as they use these hills, these routes, then, you know, they're eating. So I think if I remember right, they ate about 12 or 13 different fruiting trees in a day. And fruit eating monkeys, they digest super fast. And it may seem weird, but spider monkeys swallow most of the fruits that they eat. So they're swallowing seeds and they're digesting them. And so usually like four and a half to six hours later, they're pooping those seeds back out again. Well, if they're traveling these little pathways that you can kind of see outlined here, if they're traveling these pathways day after day, day after day, day after day, they're pooping out those seeds along those, those trails. And then as they poop around those trails, some of those seeds are going to fertilize and some of those seeds, you know, generations later are going to grow up into trees. And those trees are clearly the ones that spider monkeys want to eat. So now they're going to be a new tree along this trail. So, you know, you come back in a hundred years, you might have very different feeding trees, but you'll have the same kind of pathways. Mm -hmm. The question is, would that happen in the absence of these hills? Um, and that, that's something I don't know the answer to. If you have if you have a place that's relatively flat, would you still get these kind of pathways and would you still get the sort of seeding of your own pathways? I don't think they're planning it. I think they're, they're just pooping. But when they do, you know, they're, they're fertilizing the next generation of feeding trees. And so I think my monkeys ate in trees that were pooped out by their great, great, great grandparents. Yeah, wow. No, I mean, uh, it makes a lot of sense that even just, you know, uh, just the action of moving around and eating in the same spots all the time would reshape the ecological systems in, in the local area for sure. Um, another question I have for you is, um, you know, how self-aware are these monkeys or how, are, are these fission fusion social systems? Do you find that um, primates are more self-aware with these fission fusion systems versus other systems or um, uh, you know, do, do these, these monkeys have like, uh, any semblance of self-awareness that you could tell of? So, so can, define self-awareness in this case, just so I know where you know, self-awareness is, is kind of the, the knowing that you're a thing, a thinking thing, mm -hmm. right. Uh, or knowing that if you, you know, with the whole mirror test example, oh, yeah. you have the dot, you put the dot on their head in the mirror and if they touch the dot, then they recognize there's a sense of self, yeah. self-awareness there. Yeah, I, I don't know how self-aware they are, but I do think they, I think they must recognize that other animals know things that they don't, which is kind of self-awareness. It's, you know, recognizing differences between individuals and, and differences in knowledge, which is, which is part of the big issue of self-awareness. So, and, and this comes in into play with, with um, the fission fusion society that we have here. And actually another aspect of spider monkeys. So most monkeys, or I won't say most, quite a few monkeys anyway, um, when when a when a young monkey gets old enough to start wanting to mate it wants to leave the group it was born in because there's a risk of mating with say if you're a female mating with your father or if you're if you're a male then mating with your mother or a sister or an aunt or a cousin so most primates one or the other sex leaves when they're when they reach sexual maturity and spider in spider monkeys it's the females the females leave once they start getting that tween age or teenage they, they you know they start leaving and they go somewhere else they join a different community and so while i was studying these monkeys i had i think three or four different females join from another community and they would join my group and when you join a new area you don't know where any of the food is you've moved moved to a brand new place just like when you move to a new town you don't know where the good restaurants are you don't know where the good grocery stores are so they move to this place so they don't know where the stuff is and so what they would do is they would follow around other monkeys and um and so i think that's part of recognizing i don't know where the food is but they they must so i'll just stick with them and see and then i wasn't able to document it um but there have been some spider monkey researchers who suggest in their sites in suriname for example that some of the females each of these females kind of has their own little corner forest their own little territory and so within a territory for example one monkey in her own territory knows a lot about that territory and when she's hanging out in another monkey's kind of like specialized area of the forest she'll follow that other monkey because she knows it less well whereas if she's in her own area then she might take the lead and go you know where she where she knows where the food is and so i think in that sense I think they must have a good idea that I know things you don't know, or you know things that I don't know. Um, I, you know, it, it's hard to really test, of course, self-awareness unless you're doing, like you mentioned, the, the paint test, which we 
And I didn't ever have contact with these guys and never you know, captured any of them or anything like that. Yeah. But I, I suspect, I suspect that they, you know, they know, I know things or, you know, things and I'm going to go where you are. Cause you know, stuff. Yeah. Which is definitely a level of self-awareness of its own right. Right. I, mm. I know that you know where the food is and you, I know that I don't know where the food is. So mm-hmm. that's, that's a basic sense of self-awareness, at least, at least in my mind. Um, yeah. They, they call it, they call that intentionality. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. the, I know that, you know, or I know that, you know, that I know, or, and what's, you know, one of the weird things is we, there's levels, right? There's first order of intentionality is I know something. And second order is I know that you know something. And the third order is I know that you know that I know something. And for humans, it's about the fourth and the fifth order that our brains start to fry. So when like, I know that you know that I know that you know that I know, that's our brains. We can't handle that. And I think, I really do think that a lot of Shakespeare's plays play on that third and fourth and fifth levels of intentionality where there's mis- his comedies, where there's misunderstandings because you can't keep up with who knows that who knows that who knows of what, and then it all leads to it all falls apart because our brains are limited. And I guess I should also point out, you know, we talk about, you know, understanding human brain size when it comes to food finding humans are pretty crappy too. Like, like you said, you get lost in a forest if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, but I usually have students when I'm talking about this, I usually have to see people, everybody point to, you know, pizza hut or nobody eats a pizza hut anymore. Everybody point to McDonald's and you know, everybody points in a different direction. <laughs> like nobody quite knows exactly where it is now. But if you say, let's go to McDonald's, everybody can get there because everybody knows the roads to take to, take to get there. And so while we have imperfect knowledge of directions and you know, like what we call a, a geometric map, a, an actual heads down view of a map like you see here, mm-hmm. people have no problem navigating from place to place because they probably use a route system, you know, a road system exactly like this is. So we aren't maybe as bright as we like to think we are sometimes with regards to that. Well, I know I get lost in the grocery store sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> where is this thing? And yeah. you know, look at the little guide and, and this well, I guess okay. so, yeah. <laughs> I got so used to having a compass on my belt, you know, in, in the forest here. And I would always, always reached out and check my compass that when I got back to the States and I'd step out of a store at a mall, my instinct would be to grab my compass to figure out what direction did I just come from and what direction am I going to next? Like it just, I would always reach down for my compass and it wouldn't be there. And it took me a while to break that habit. Yeah. And I know um, here in Colorado, we're lucky because you can look West, at least in Denver and know the mountains are always West, yeah. right? So you yeah. can always orient yourself. And that definitely helps me uh, when I sometimes do things like delivery driving or just trying to find a new location or anything like that. So, um, so- Given the time, I think we're going to move into questions now. We've got okay, a couple yeah. of questions already up. Unless there's any final things you want to just add in before we. No, I mean I can talk for hours about this stuff. So you, let's go with questions because otherwise I'll just I'll just ramble. All right, uh, Alicia Burris says, "Was there Hi. a human?" Hi, Alicia. I, Alicia's a former student of mine. So oh, hello, perfect. Alicia. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Alicia. Uh, was there a human impact in the monkeys' resources, such as logging or fruit trees, at your site? <laughs> Um, I'm going to say yes. So, um, and this, there's actually, so a little bit of a trigger warning, maybe, um, here it's not grotesque or bad, but the area that I worked was part of the, uh, we'll put it here and uh, apologies for the nudity, but the, the, the area that I worked was surrounding, a, um, a, an area called the Warani ethnic reserve. So this is where the Warani people, this is the Warani in their traditional outfits. They don't dress like that now, but the Warani ethnic reserve, and this is where, um, it's their their homeland but they also lived in the area where i lived too and so this this gentleman here his name was pago and he's one of the the warani people who lived in the very near the forest where i worked and legally even though it's a national park they're allowed to hunt so um they they could hunt legally now we made deals with them we said look can you just not hunt in this area of the forest where we are so that we we don't get shot we don't get hurt and the monkeys can stay safe but i mean this picture here on the right I found on one of my trails one day, this is clearly somebody playing with a machete. They've clearly killed some kind of a bird and they were just, you know, in the feathers in there for, I don't know, I call this wall running graffiti. I don't know what it is, but it clearly shows people where they're hunting. In fact, I actually ran into this gentleman. Um, I ran into him in the forest one day. He was hunting in my forest and I had to explain to him, look, you're not allowed to be here and you have to leave, which was maybe one of the more terrifying experiences I had because uh, this gentleman was famous for having murdered his brother. Um, he killed his brother and stole his brother's wife, or not stole, I guess, uh, that, that gives her no agency. He, he murdered his brother and then married his brother's wife, I guess I should say. And and so it was him and the wife I ran into in the forest. He's armed with a machine, with a shotgun and a machete, and I'm armed with a 
flashlight and a compass. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I had to actually say to him, to an armed person I know murdered someone, I had to say to him, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to be here. You have to leave. And, and he said, okay, okay. He liked me. Thank God. He said, okay, okay. And then I turned around and five minutes later, I hear the shotgun go off. And that, at that, that point, I just said, you know, I'm done for the day. I'm not putting my life in risk, yeah. um, you know, for him. But so, and, and just to sort of illustrate again, and this is the sort of trigger. I mean, I didn't take these pictures. I, I got these pictures from someone else. So, um, I, and I wish I could remember the name of the person off the top of my head to give them full credit. But um, you see here roasting on this fire at a Warani camp. This is this is a monkey and uh, probably the same kind of bird that I had um, in the picture. It could be a chicken because he had chickens. And this spider monkey that he had here is actually a pet. It's probably a pet because almost really they shot his mother. We did we did have a constant threat of hunting in the forest as well. Okay. And so maybe not, maybe not logging. Yeah, yeah, maybe not logging, but the oil company, you know, in that sense, the oil company did some forest cutting and some logging as well. Mm. So they, they had that same kind of, of uh, impact on the forest. You know, the building of the roads, for example, changed. Um, yeah, the, the, oil, the oil well right down here was, mm. this is the, the tree my monkey slept in a lot. You can see that tree overlooking this oil well, and this is underneath that tree looking down at just this huge cleared area. So that clearly has an effect, even if it's not indigenous people, this is the, the oil exploitation for the region. Right, right, that makes sense. Uh, Ryan Stuckey asked, how does- Oh, the... another former student, hello, Ryan. <laughs> well, thanks also for coming, Ryan. How does the fission fusion behavior patterns uh, impact communication among the group? Would it take long for the word that was word that a tree was cold for ripe fruit did they waste time going to empty trees yeah so yeah that's a really really good question um almost certainly they wouldn't be they wouldn't be able to communicate that directly um i, I don't think they would be able to have a conversation about that and so what that means is you know very often there would be these mistakes where you go to a tree and there's nothing in it and primatologists call this scramble competition Right, there's two kinds of broad competition. There's contests where we all fight with each other. You know, we, you and I fight over a feeding tree and the winner gets to eat and the loser has to go away. Or you and I fight over a mate or whatever that is. Um, with a scramble competition, it's like, it's like a, I describe it like an Easter egg hunt, right? It's like a, like a preschool Easter egg hunt. There's so many eggs out there and all the kids are running to grab them. And if you go look at a place that's already been grabbed, you're not going to find anything. And it's like that with the monkeys too. So you always risk going to a tree that your friends already went and visited and cleaned out. You know, they're going to go and eat all the ripest fruits in the tree and then go somewhere else. You might show up later in the day and go, dang it, I was hoping there'd be something here and there's nothing here. So now you got to go somewhere else. So th that is actually one, and because they can't communicate that directly. Now, the only thing, the only way they can do that, maybe indirectly communicate is if you follow somebody else to, to a feeding tree and then, you know, hopefully they know about it but um yeah i think that that's that's actually an unfortunate i think they can't communicate that so i think that's actually a, a constant thing you show up and like oh there's not as much as i thought there would be or, or as i hoped there would be or damn it somebody else cleared it out you know before i could get there like toilet paper during covid right like toilet, yeah you go there <laughs> the shelves are empty like, ah yeah we, we call that scramble competition and and that you know scramble competition and contest competition are two important drives in primate sociality and i think for fish and fusion primates, scramble competition is incredibly it is incredibly important for them. So then you want to get then you're like then you're racing out early. I'm going to go out early and go to the right feeding tree early, or I'm going to go to the ones that they can't clear out. That's that's the other possibility. They're these super producing trees. If you could just, you know, there whenever you go, there's always something there, kind of like Costco. Wow. <laughs> that's right. So when now I had to go like four or five places to find toilet paper during COVID, and I finally went to Costco in there. Sure enough, yeah. the super producer. <laughs> yeah, the giant stack there. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Or I go to Costco. I remember during the early part, we went there, and I kept seeing people carrying these giant rolls of toilet paper. And I was like, okay, there's clearly toilet paper here. So then you have to like run around. Where are they getting it from? And try to steal their information and then mm -hmm. find the pile and hope it's not gone before you get there. I had that experience. Yeah, and I'm sure that's what they experience on a daily basis mm -hmm. in, the, in yes. the jungle, right? All day, every day. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, you know, that's mostly what they do is is run around, look for food, and then if you're a male, you know that becomes a secondary priority behind running around and look for mates. Yeah, yeah. And which, which reminds is, me, yeah. uh, it's you said in one of your papers that you followed around only the females for the mm -hmm. study because of males being distracted with reproductive opportunities, right? Is that 
Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, males primary, they've got to eat, but you know, males are inefficient future society. Um, many primates usually try to detect when, so two steps backwards, females typically only mate in primates, um, when they ovulate humans and bonobos are an exception, but, but female monkeys typically only mate when they're, they're ovulating. And so males, if looking for a mating opportunity, have to figure out when females are ovulating. And they often do that using olfactory cues or, or maybe sniffing urine or something like that. And if the females aren't together in one place, that makes it even harder. So now you've got to like travel around and try to find all these little fission fusion females and visit them all. And, you know, so I feel like the male's day is like, are you ovulating? No. Okay. I'll see you later. Are you ovulating? No. Okay. I'll see you later. Are you, and then just wander around finding different sets of females. They got to eat sure, but you know, male primates probably so they're going to follow females and, and often when i saw them they would be at the back of the group traveling mm. and because they have such a large range they might not have the specialized knowledge that the females have whereas the females are, are primarily motivated by by getting food because that's what drives their reproductive success sure interesting so not too different from humans right <laughs> no well i tell my students it's, it's the origin of the, of the first date right you, as a yeah. male you take her out you buy her food um, because food is motive is a motivating factor, at least in, in the 1950 traditional style of first date. I realize times have changed, but I haven't dated in years, so I'm, I'm out off the market. But the you know, and then the males hoping for theoretical reproductive success somewhere down the line because of it. Cool. Uh, okay, so Kelly Mitchell asks, did you notice the monkeys behaving differently around you compared to the indigenous hunters or the oil workers? Could the monkeys identify yes. which humans were a threat and which humans were not? They yes, so they rec believe it or not, they actually recognized individuals. They they knew me, for example. And if I brought a, if I brought an indigenous person with me for a little while, I had a, a student, I mean a younger Warani person, come with me as a guide. I didn't really need him, but I was just sort of doing somebody a favor. And they treated him differently than me. I think they recognized that he was, you know, either not familiar or a threat. But they knew me, and just 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 give you a really a really nice little story about knowing me. Um, Actually, I can tell too. I can tell too many stories. But uh, after my dissertation work was over, and I was back in the states, I was doing my write up. I, I got a little bit more money. I had a little bit more research money, so I went back down to Ecuador to gather a few things that I was missing. A couple data points, trail points, mostly that I was missing. And while I was down in in Ecuador, I'd been gone for a year. I was on the trails at one of those spots that was a good place to find monkeys, just quite accidentally. And the monkeys came by, and when they first saw me, they ran. They just scattered and ran. I think they thought I was a threat. But because I knew their travel routes, I had an idea where they were going. So I circled around and I went to where I would intersect them. And it was amazing to me because while they were fleeing from me, they would they actually passed over my head while I was waiting for them. And each one, one at a time, I saw them look down, recognize me, and then they just they completely just relaxed. And then they would just like walk calmly. The next one would run up and go, oh, you. And then they would just go on. So they knew exactly who I was. They recognized me personally. And wow. w without taking up too much time, so college senior year, I studied a spider monkey in, in Virginia, at the Norfolk Zoo in Virginia. Flash forward years later, he gets transferred to a zoo in, um, San, in San Antonio, Texas. And I happened to live in Austin at that time. So I went to go visit him just after he got released into the exhibit. So first day of this guy in exhibit, haven't seen him in two years. Um, first day in the exhibit, he comes out all the monkeys come out they begin feeding and then he looks up and he saw me now at that point i'd grown my hair long and i was you know a little bit different but he saw me he ran over to where i was put his back up to the cage so that i could scratch him because i used to do that at the zoo i wasn't supposed to but i used to do that at the zoo and then you know the lady standing next to me is like oh it looks like he knows you and i'm like crying like he does know me you know, like, <laughs> hadn't seen him in two years and he recognized me so and then every time i'd go to the zoo after that he would come and greet me and then whenever I would leave, he would climb up to the highest part of the of the exhibit and watch me until I left. So they really, I think they really, they can recognize individuals for sure. And they definitely treated, they, they treated people they didn't know. And I think they also treated, and this is going to sound awful, but I think they, they must pay attention, at least must cue in on complexion a little bit, because I think that was, or, or maybe there's something olfactory, maybe it's the smell of campfire or something, but it's something about indigenous people that made them even more nervous. So I, I think that's, um, you know, whatever they're queuing on, I think they, they definitely recognize that. Are they a regular staple in the indigenous uh, diet? Okay, so that, yeah. that makes sense, that, that there'd be yeah. some sort of 
cue. It could be, yeah, it could be olfactory. It could be a visual mm -hmm. cue. It could be a lot of things that. that yeah, I, I, it could be sound. Who knows? Yeah. I was generally very quiet. I, I didn't. I was by myself most of the time, so I didn't really talk. One day, I accidentally, one of my monkeys sneezed, and I, without thinking, I said, "Bless you." Monkey freaked out. She goes, "What was that?" I, they, they weren't used to me talking, so. Uh, that would be exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, what other questions do we have uh, for Scott here? Uh, any other questions? Often people ask me about the dangers of field work, and that's one of the things that people are really excited about. Is it you know was it ever dangerous in the forest? Um, and I, I happened to have in the slideshow a couple pictures of things that I ran into while I was in the forest. Um, we, we almost stepped on this. This was a um, Amazon Oa. Oh, okay, uh, I see. It's yeah. The head is about as about was about the size of my fist, and the body was about as big around as my forearm. And this was in the leaf litter. We almost stepped on. We all, we actually what you see here is us actually pulled a little bit of the leaves off the top of it. So we almost stepped on this one. I don't know that this would have been like a deadly encounter, but certainly not a pleasant one. Um, especially if it had wrapped around my student. Um, this is a pit viper that we saw on a log we climbed over. So there's there were pit vipers. Um, this was a pit viper I saw, uh, a venomous snake. I was having lunch one day, and this was sitting in the leaf litter not too far away from where I was sitting when I spotted it. And it was really calm, so I sat and I got my tripod out, my camera out, and I took pictures of it for half an hour. Um, this, these gentlemen are, are a number of Ecuadorian botanists, and this was a snake that they killed because it actually tried to strike the gentleman in the in the center there, the, in the green shirt, um, Milton. And and this was a this is a kind of a snake called a pushmaster, um, and they're equally large and highly venomous, and perhaps the most dangerous snake in South America. Wow. So you know, this is an anaconda that I took a picture of, and I, I have to say this: I've never ever in my life seen a snake as big as this one. Um, this one, the that bottom coil down there was about as big around as my waist and wow. you know a 30 something it was this was i've never seen it was about um 14 feet long uh, maybe 12 to 14 feet long if i remember right but it was i've never seen a snake this massive in my life i've seen big snakes but nothing nothing is ever compared to this one right here um and so you know thailand this is quick thailand pictures you know we had scorpions obviously um uh, this is a, a monitor lizard about six feet long um thailand we had Cobras, king cobras, venomous snakes in the trees. Um, we had all kinds of stuff there. Um, we had elephants, um, tigers, gaur. In Ecuador, we had jaguars, and, and you would occasionally run into any of those things. So there were always exciting dangers. Did you ever ever have any any close dangerous encounters with animals? Yeah, actually, um, this is Thailand. So the, the the worst encounter. Well, I mean, I've. I, in the forest, I've run into, um, I, I ran into a jaguar a couple times in, in the forest, you know, I, I've run into um, venomous snakes a bunch of times. Um, I run into a couple king cobras here and there in Thailand. Um, the, the worst encounter I had was was this one. Um, so in Thailand, we're very similar, except that we got back and forth from our field site along a paved road in the middle of this national park. We, rode, we drove motorcycles to get back and forth. It's a more efficient, gas efficient, everything. And one evening we're driving back from the field site. Um, I was on a bike with, with one of my students or one of my field assistants and she was riding with me and our, our other assistant was with us on the other motorcycle. And we came around a corner and this, I don't know if you see this, the creature in the upper left here, this is called a gower. This beast up here in the upper left, this kind of creature, it's like a one ton bull, was feeding on the side of the road in, on bamboo. And about the time we came around the corner, um, I turned to my to the student behind me, Lauren, and I said, you know, hey, look, there's a gower on the side of the road. And the gower spooked when it heard the motorcycle, so it ran across the road, and we met in the middle. Um, its shoulder hit my shoulder while we're driving on a motorcycle, and obviously it weighs a ton, and we don't. So it flattened the motorcycle, and we slid underneath it as it ran across the road, you know, across the road. It was, I'll say, we, I wasn't going very fast, but it was a moderate motorcycle accident. And Lauren actually had to leave the forest, had to leave the field because she tore her ACL and, and had to get stitches in her head from, from even wearing a helmet where her head hit the road. Um, I, my injuries were, were less bad, although cut scratches, bruises, and I couldn't lift my arms for two weeks. But this is me the next day after that accident. Um, 
local Thai people built me a little bed full of mentholated leaves and, and uh, lemongrass and so on, fire underneath it. And then they roasted me for about eight or nine hours that day, which they said was important for, and they said if I didn't do that, I would die. So I went along with it. So that was probably my, my worst encounter wow. with, a, with a wild animal. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't use my, my arms wouldn't raise up past my, you know, I, I couldn't take my shirt on and off. I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't sneeze because it hurt too bad. I couldn't laugh because it hurt too bad. Um, oh, and so I was put you out of commission about three or four weeks. Uh, really? Wow. Yeah, that, that was, that was the worst. I mean, I, other, there was another time I got really, really sick with who knows what kind of illness. And I was out for about three or four weeks as well. But this was, this was the, yeah, this was about three or four weeks when I couldn't, fortunately I was part of a research team there. This is our, this is in Thailand. So I couldn't go to the forest. I, I was actually the manager anyway, so I could, send other people out to collect the data and then I could just mostly just do the research station stuff. But yeah, this was, this was perhaps my, my biggest, <laughs> my biggest challenge or my biggest injury. Uh, Kelly asks, who are a bigger danger animals in the field or the people you run across in, in the field, in the forest? Uh, that's a really good question. I would always argue people because they're less predictable. Um, you know, it, you can often with an, but animals don't want to mess with you. Now I, I, Elephants, I think, could be incredibly dangerous, and I did run into elephants a few times in ways that terrified me. But um, you know, like with an, with an elephant, for example, you just hide and stand still, and if it, hopefully it'll it'll leave you alone. Or if you if you spot a venomous snake, well, just don't touch it, don't go near it, and you're fine. Even with a king cobra, if you're far enough away and it raises up at you, you know it's going to run away. Humans, you don't know what they're going to do. So I, I would argue humans are, are more dangerous than than. Um, than animals but of course I've, I've i've really i've honestly spent like thousands and thousands of hours in rainforests and i've never been bitten by a snake i've been stung by bees sure but i've never been bitten by a snake so um i think i i would say and then i've been in forests with highly venomous snakes and so um i would say humans are probably the, the most dangerous i would think yeah i would imagine a human walking around with a shotgun is a lot more scary because you never know when he's gonna turn and shoot or anything like that sure and, and in Ecuador, also the area we worked was just south of Colombia, just south of the what they call it La Frontera, the, the frontier region, the sort of borderless region between Colombia and Ecuador. And it was highly rumored that some of the the guerrilleros, the the, the the guerrilla groups, would evade authorities by moving down into the Ecuadorian part of the forest. And so there was always potentially a, a, a risk of um, the 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 guerrillas, G G U E R, the guerrillas. Um, you know, in the area. And it actually happened that they actually did show up at the research station one time when I wasn't there. I mean, this was a, a year or two after I left. So um, they did, they didn't do anything to the researchers, but because colleges aren't going to pay a ransom for, for, you know, your, for, for your professor or whatever. Um, so they only went after oil workers because um, oil, com <laughs> yeah, oil companies have, have um, kidnap insurance, but they just like, okay, scientists, you're fine. We'll leave you alone. They'll go after the go after the money sources. But so there was always that kind of risk too. But I always figured I knew the forest, you know, way better than anybody else did. And so I I, I knew where the water was. I knew where I could hide. I could even follow monkeys and find food. So I, I figured I'd be fine if I ever if I ever had to, I could hide in the forest and I'd be fine nice. for a few days anyway. That's quite a skill to develop there. Yeah, I mean, you spend thousands of hours in the forest there. You you get used to it and you you kind of know where the things are. But um, yeah yeah it's a different way of knowing the world right it is and and it's it's an exciting way you know you one of the things i i experienced was um i studied what monkeys ate so you have to start to learn plants to identify plants and in the beginning it's just green and then after you start to learn to identify plants and trees now it's different kinds of green and now you can begin to recognize things over and over again and the world looks different when you want when you understand the details of it better even as a monkey person I had to learn botany. You know, I had to I had to be proficient at um, plant identification in the rainforest and bird identification because it interested me, or reptiles, or insects, or you know, all kinds of stuff. So, you wind up learning a lot more than you than you ever expected to ever want to learn. But it's it's totally worth it. Huh. Well, very cool. All right, we're just about out of time here. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us about uh, your research or really anything? Well, what I will say is, and this you know, for for anybody who might be interested, you know, when I when I was first writing, applying for colleges, they asked us to write an essay about somebody we admired, and I picked Jane Goodall because I thought she that was pretty, she was pretty awesome. But in my mind, I thought, well, you know, I'll never be Jane Goodall because how many 
Jane Goodall is just the world, can the world sustain? How many different people can study primates? And so I thought it would be really cool to do, but I never thought of it as a real career choice. But then when I got to college and I discovered there's actually opportunities and then got to graduate school and discovered, oh my God, you can, there's actually places you can go and then field sites you can visit and, and discovered that it's actually, a, it is a viable, uh, you know, a, a research choice. So even if it seems like something that, that may be challenging to do, it's absolutely doable. And, and I've had adventures that I think, you know, I could probably spend three hours talking about just wild field stories, the things that have happened at various times. And so I think it's, it's, it's completely an amazing thing. And I always tell my friends too, you know, I may not have the kinds of academic money careers that they have, but, you know, I've got some really nice life adventures. And if I die young, at least I'll have, you can, you can write all the really cool things I've seen on my, on my tombstone. And I think it's, you know, I think it's a, a, a rich kind of life to have had. So I really do encourage students, anybody who might be interested to pursue this as a field choice, as a career choice, because it, it, it's incredible to get the places you go, the languages you learn, the things you, you know, the animals you see, the adventures you have. It, it is a lot of, and, and this, of course, the science you do on top of that is, is also important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like, honestly, it sounds like a pretty incredible uh, experience, some pretty incredible experiences uh, you've had, and I'd love to talk to you further about them sometime, but uh, I think we're just about out of time here, uh, yeah. and I just wanted to thank you for coming on. Uh, we will be uploading uh, links and stuff to uh, uh, Professor Suarez's, uh, uh, the, to the video, to the description section uh, here in the next couple hours sometime. Um, and you know, if you're watching this in the future, probably they're already there. Uh, so go ahead and look in the description for more information and check out his, his articles, uh, that you can find here. And thank you so much for coming and talking about oh. this. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate getting to talk about the stuff I love the most. So thank you for doing this. All right. Uh, have a great weekend. See you soon, everybody.